My name is Stacy Fitzgerald, and I'm a filmmaker. Arrogant college boy. You know he's actually on a three-year plan to become rich? It gets on my nerves. Yeah, well, it sounds a lot like me. No, man, you're different. You're a failure. I first became aware of the power of the moving image, I think, in, in the 1970s, growing up then. You know, it was the time of the energy crisis, and my father was an engineer for NASA, but still government salary, and times were tight, and you know, a little stressful in the household, just in terms, you know, happy household, but certainly uh, money issues during that time, I think, for a lot of Americans. And we were watching Mel Brooks, talk about his upcoming movie, Young Frankenstein. And as part of that, they played a clip of the film, and it happened to be the clip where the monster is going to visit the blind man in his hut. And I just remember my father, this very quiet, pragmatic engineer, completely stressed out about what was going on in the economy and everything else, suddenly start laughing, and, and laughing so hard he started to cry, and this is a you know, men don't cry, but he certainly, certainly cried. And I think it was, he literally had to get up and leave the room, he was laughing so hard. And I thought then, of course, we were laughing, we loved it, we were kids, but I thought that, that adults, you know, it was the first time that it hit me that it, this wasn't just entertainment for us, that it had, had an impact on these grown-ups. And, you know, his, his mood after that, how it was lightened and, more engaged, and, and you know, the experience of sharing that. Look, Mommy, a pizza boy. Pizza boy? <laughs> Does this bag look like a pizza confinement, does it, huh? I think I can help one person overcome their fear of the outside. For the love of God, Molly, don't harass the agoraphobic. <gasps> hey, hey, don't be frightened. I I'm here to help. <laughs> photography growing up. My father had an eight millimeter camera, but we weren't allowed to touch it. Dad, only dad could, could touch the camera. So certainly I watched my father go around and, and film family festivities. And you know, we watched uh, Christmas Eve every year. That's when we would start to watch the old films. So I think film you know, was part of my life then. And I've, then I became the designated, I could be the still photographer. I certainly could handle that. I just wasn't big enough to handle the eight millimeter film. But I made, I would write and then direct my younger brother and sister and little, I wouldn't even call them plays. We had just funny skits, probably based a lot off of the Little Rascals or Abbott Costello or uh, Young Frankenstein. So I think just in terms of storytelling was what I did when I was younger. I don't think filmmaking itself um, occurred to me until my 20s. I had, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had a finance degree, very important for, uh, especially during those times, we were the first kind of women going out and, and being able to choose technically any career we wanted. And um, there was, at least for my father, you know, women could always do these other things. You need to look at business or engineering, something that women typically don't go into because it's very important to be independent. So the focus then was on financial independence. And then I have a, a job in finance and I was like, but this, uh, you know, I'm not really having fun. I'm not enjoying life. And there has to be more than just working for health insurance and a pension. There's got to be something more. So I started exploring, you know, I, was, I always had, I was a film fanatic, I was the person you wanted on your team for Trivial Pursuit, if anybody remembers that game, for entertainment. Um, certainly a film fanatic and loved writing, loved photography. And suddenly it was a, a good friend of mine that just called me up out of the blue and just said, you're a filmmaker. I said, what do you, t do girls make films? That just had been blocked from my mind. Um, I'd never thought about making a film. And when he told me that, I said, oh my gosh, you're right. It takes into everything. I love you know, the writing, the photography, film as a storytelling medium itself. All of it kind of um, you know, hit home for me. And then the next week, I um, looked into going back to film school here at, at Georgia State. So it was that quick where it was like, 
how this has been staring, in, staring me in the face my entire life. How did I not realize it? The first film camera I picked up was actually in film school at Georgia State. My younger brother Michael had written this script, Delivery Boy Chronicles, and we had been collaborators growing up, and certainly <clears throat> we you know, had talked about Delivery Boy Chronicles. But I loved the script because um, not only hilarious dialogue, uh, you know, wonderful characters, but I thought it encapsulated, through comedy, it kind of spoke to this Generation X. You know, they were the first generation of latchkey kids that had kind of uh, dropped out, they say, of society. And, and I thought that that sort of skepticism they had about America, America's systems, um, the uh, multinational conglomerate corporations owning every, everybody was buying everything up. You didn't know what product, you know, who owned what anymore. So, Molly, what is it you want to do again? Well, like Pearl S. Buck, I want to travel and help the cause for women around the world. Who? Pearl S. Buck, the chick on Hee Haw. You know, but it's hard to compete with our generation's greatest conflict, animal rights. No, 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 no. She wasn't on Hee Haw. She's on the Grand Old Opry. You know, it just seems like nobody cares anymore. I mean, other generations, they burnt things. You know, the feminists, they burnt their bras. Students burnt their draft cards. I mean, what do we have to burn? Our social security cards. <laughs> she was on both. She was on the Grand Ole Opry first. That's how she got the hee haw gig. Right. And their resistance, I think, was dro kind of dropping out. Um, and so you get that whole, that, you know, I think it's in that genre of slackers and clerks and, and things like that. You know, it wouldn't hurt for y'all to be just a little more spiritual. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Fire it up, Sean. I love the idea of exploring Generation X. I came right before that so I could kind of relate this idea that I didn't want to just work for health insurance and a pension, but I still stayed within that system. But this generation said, no, I'd rather deliver pizzas. I'd rather deliver food. I'd rather just keep the roof over my head and enjoy my life. And I thought that was a form of resistance to what was going on in, in society at that time. So uh, somebody that reviewed Delivery Boy Chronicles later said it was a political satire disguised as a stoner film. It's not that it set out to make a political satire, but I think it shows the cynicism of Generation X. So I think it got my love of comedy. I mean, to me, there was no choice that my first project was gonna be comedy growing up on you know, Mel Brooks and other, other wonderful films. I'm joining the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps? The Peace Corps is a front for the CIA. Where do you get these conspiracy theories? So, why do you want to join the Peace Corps? <laughs> well, I want to travel and, and explore new cultures and help people around the world help themselves. Great. That's why we joined too, to help out other people. Every time I hear the Kennedy speech, ask not what your country can do for but you. But what you can do for your country. God, I love that speech. I mean, to this day, it just really gets to me. Great. So let's talk about any positive attributes you could bring to the Peace Corps. Like, uh, for example, uh, a comprehensive knowledge of the Asian financial markets. Hong Kong Exchange, Singapore, Taiwan. No. Can you speak in a Cantonese dialect? Hokey in Taiwanese. Zian or Gan? <laughs> Are you a skilled marksman or have any experience in urban warfare tactics? I don't even own a gun. Would you be willing to kill or die for the Peace Corps? I don't, I don't think so. We'll keep your resume on file and call you when we need you. <laughs> so we've got the script and I'm trying to raise funding. And I think at first, yeah, you know, and I've saved money, right? I know that I've got my day job, I'm saving money, I'm gonna do this film, I'm gonna do this film wow, I've got $50,000, I could probably do this film. And then I go talk to a couple of DPs and they laugh at me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let me, 
let's step, step back and reevaluate. I also had a, another uh, partner um, who, was, who became our executive producer and was also willing to invest some money, so I had an investor. And interestingly, he was a baby boomer, but a, more of a hippie baby boomer, and he, this whole Gen X thing resonated with him. And so to him, it was getting at some of the issues that his own generation was feeling. You know how this ebbs and flows, but it was interesting that they had that connection. And so therefore, he, he really wanted to support the project. So I had that. But it still felt like it wasn't going to have enough money, and it just felt like, how was I going to get this done? I'm still working for the Treasury Department. At the meantime, my um, sister-in-law was diagnosed with uh, stage four ovarian cancer. And I happened to be talking to her on the phone. She was waiting to hear at that time the staging, but she knew it was probably pretty bad. I was, t she just wanted to know, she didn't want to talk about herself, didn't want to talk about the cancer. She said, what's going on with the film? What are you guys doing? And I said, you know, we just don't have enough money. I can't necessarily pull together then the crew that I need to, to do. Michael didn't write the script as an independent film. It's got I, 60 locations, something ridiculous. Um, maybe we've bitten off more than we can chew. Maybe, you know, I went through all of these things and she said something that just, again, rang as true. She said, do what you love today because you're, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And it's a hard lesson that I've learned. So I'm just telling you, you're never gonna have enough money the script's never going to be exactly where you need it to be. All these things are not going to just fall into place. That's not how it happens. You just have to go forward. And, you know, I hung up the phone and then walked down the hall and quit my job. And so it's not that when we started it, we had the money. It was going forward and then finding, okay, well, now we've got this much money raised through, you know, family, friends, um, this investor. Uh, who, who, you know, put in more money, and I shouldn't say investor, partner. And then as it started to grow, as we put the crew together and started casting, then we just found that suddenly we started getting, getting what we needed. And I think the Atlanta community really pulled together. The actors in the community came in and um, we had a, a wonderful cast. We were able to cast Sean Mullins, which then helped again. That was right when his big hits were out. And so it's just this momentum built. Read the Bet Now Expo. This is it. Are you sure this is it, man? I thought Molly said it was a monk from Hollywood. Tibet, Buddhism, same thing. And so it's just this momentum built. And so that's how we managed to get the, get the money. And then at some point we hit up uh, American Express, but <laughs> we were able to keep debt financing to uh, a limited amount. Well, there, you know, two levels of success. I would say um, great personal success in terms of actually getting it done because you know you get the you, you get it shot, get it in the can, so to speak, and then you've got to, of course, independent filmmaking, raise more money for editing, sound design, and get it complete. Uh, finally, get it completed. These aren't these aren't shrooms. But I got attacked by ostriches for this. I think they're emus. Are you sure it's not a shroom? Lord. I mean... I shouldn't have eaten that ostrich shroom. Now it's time to grab the bull by its horns. Mike Tyler? I'm Mr. Vaughn. Nice to meet you. As I was saying, we have a saying around here, and that is a leader who knows how to follow the bottom line. You know, selling is like an art, Mike. And when you sell, you become the artist. What do you see in that painting there? It's an elephant uh, with a man and a sword, and he's, he's looking at the fish swimming around and mocking him. And then, you know, we took it on the festival circuit, and, and we learned a lot of lessons about marketing and 
we were so excited being a film festival and it was like, but now you got to get people to come see your film in a film festival and so that whole marketing experience. And then after that we were able to secure a distributor and you know, so we didn't make our money back, but I, we didn't expect to. That was all, all very exciting and, and so, so successful, I would say, if you were measuring it, um, not necessarily in financial success, but in, in personal success. In Donegal, when I was growing up, Christmas was a family time. That's what was important about Christmas. My mother would have the midnight mass and some of us would go down to the choir with her. My father would be in the bar and when they'd come back, we'd sit around the piano and sing songs, Christmas carols. The, the Southern Celtic Christmas concert was really a celebration in music, poetry, and dance of the connections between Ireland and the American South. And my father's from Northwest Alabama, from the hills, and our, my ancestors um, came from Ireland. I mean, other places, and um, uh, Heinz 57 for sure, but certainly a lot of Irish in there. And so there was a, a personal connection to the music, both the Appalachian music that was featured in that concert as well as the Irish music. In that piece, this, you know, it was an hour long program for eventually for public television. We also incorporated in documentary elements. So we had interviews with the um, musicians and with other, other artists. Um, and there were some amazing ones, Moya Brennan, Grammy Award winner, Alison Brown, Rising Appalachia, incredible um, uh, sister duo here in, in the States, hauntingly beautiful voices, and others. And they um, you know, talked about the influences on their music and just those different connections between the Appalachian South and Ireland. Our mother was originally a jazz pianist, and she took us on a trip to Ireland. She started getting into Celtic music, and she said, you know, she wanted to go hear some of the music from, from Ireland. She came up to the group of musicians, and she said, you play this, this amazing music, and I'm studying Celtic music. And they said, well, where are you from? She said, I'm, I'm from Georgia. They said, you're from Georgia. Oh, the most beautiful fiddle music comes out of those mountains. fun project and I think it opened me up to this idea of doing a documentary. A friend of mine, Martha Kelly, um, she is a, a wonderful writer and she spent 10 years researching the story. She wrote a work of historical fiction, it'll be out in the spring, published by Random House. It's called Lilac Girls and the story is about these young Polish women in World War II who um, joined the resistance, the Polish underground resistance. They were eventually caught by the Gestapo, tortured, and put into this concentration camp known as Ravensbrück, the largest women's concentration camp in the Third Reich. These women, they get put in this camp, subjected to these horrible medical experiments on their legs. The Nazis tried to recreate war wounds and infect them with aggressive bacteria, glass, wood chips, and 
the hopes of causing gas gangrene. After one group, there was another, and next, and next. There were 74 of us. They operated on me twice in the same spot, and some of my friends were operated on five times. And the wound had to heal itself somehow, and for some it would, and for others it wouldn't. Five people died from these surgeries, from the gangrene. They became known as the rabbits, and it was because they were both guinea pigs and um, because they used to hop around camp because their legs were injured. Allied armies press forward on all fronts toward the heart of Germany. Towards the end of the war, um, when the Germans realize we're going to lose, it's time to get rid of all evidence of war crimes. So they were going to execute all of the remaining rabbits. One day came an order to execute all of us. And in the direction of our block, which was at the end of the camp, the block number 52. It turns out that a large group of Germans, the SS men, came from the direction of the office, their machine guns drawn, ready to shoot, as if they were going to a battle. All the women in the Ravensbrück camp came together to rescue these women and literally right in front of the SS. They grab them, they hide them all over the camp, and they keep them hidden basically for three months until liberation. The amazing part is that most of these women managed to survive. Women were able to live to testify at the Nuremberg trials against the doctors. You could say that the entire camp helped us, hid us, protected us. We went over to Ravensbrook for the commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the liberation of the camp, and I was able to interview two of the remaining five Polish women that were subjected to the experimental surgeries. Ravensbrook was a little different in terms of a concentration camp. A vast majority were political prisoners. Over 23 nations were represented there of women who were in some form of resistance against the Nazi regime. What struck me about all of that is like, okay, I know the war is almost up. I'm starving to death. I, you know, we're all suffering from diseases of overcrowding and malnutrition, and yet I'm still going to risk my life to save, let's say I'm French, these women from Poland. And maybe they're Catholic, and I'm Lutheran, or maybe I'm Jewish. But these women banded together to save these 63 women. And so this idea of strength through empathy and compassion being sometimes more powerful than weapons starts to emerge. Martha's story touches on those elements and, and more. My exploration is how they accomplished it. And that's not documented. You pick up bits and pieces of it in books, um, but a lot of it is, is gonna die with, with these women. Unfortunately, we've paid very little attention to how women survived during the war and especially in the concentration camps. And the best way to know is to talk to them. It's an exciting time to be an independent filmmaker. I mean, you've never had so many tools at your disposal. I think it's amazing to have a, a, a young nephew who's an incredible editor at the age of 17. <laughs> he's been making his own films because he's, you know, I mean, you do it with an iPhone. And I'd say have faith in your vision, in your own inner voice. And don't always think I'm the only person in the world that thinks this. there's this group out there. It doesn't matter if it's you know, everybody or just that small group that you're speaking to, but you've got a legitimate voice, a legitimate vision, a legitimate message, idea, story to tell. Don't be afraid of telling it. As a junior account executive, you'll work 60 hours a week. And this, this is where we make our art. <sighs> this will be your future. It's time to settle. It's time to settle. 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 Just budget out the luxuries. Mike, we can't live like this for the rest of our lives. I mean, you have a business degree. How long have you been at this restaurant on wheels? Cigarettes are not addictive. They're not addictive. I want my parliament. I have money to pay here. It 
It's okay, put out your hands. On the fast track. But watch your back. Going over me is in subordination. Mastering the maze. You want to raise, but that would cause wage inflation. It's a paradox. It's a synergy. It's perfect corporate harmony. Dippy, dippy, dippity do. We've got advice just for you. Dippy, dippy, dippity do. A lot of money will make you free. One of the stubborn who blindly resist, they become little communists. What becomes of our corporate man? At first he becomes Republican. Hey, but I'm libertarian. Jacket no, it's off. okay, it's okay, I'm fine, I'm fine. No, you're not, you're sweating profusely. Just, take no. your jacket off. Take your jacket off. Okay, okay, you want it? Take it, take the jacket. What? Okay, I was attacked by a herd of ostriches this morning, okay? What? You don't believe me? Emus, maybe. Yeah. 